and welcome to Bibliophilia. I'm Becca Chavez, and today we're discussing Confessions of an English Opium Eater. Hi, and welcome to the show. We're back with Scott. Scott's here again. Hi, everyone. Hi. So we've kind of got an interesting... And interesting, how. Yeah. Interesting book today, because it's our first nonfiction book, which right. is really exciting, because we're going to do... We'll, we'll probably do a few more of these, probably... I know Plato's The Symposium is like one of my favorites. Please, let's not. No it's my Plato. favorite. Okay. I love Plato. All right. Whatever. Um, all right. So our theme music is by Joseph Scardetta, that song you just heard. Our sponsors are The Cruelty, which is your book. It is my book. Hey. <laughs> As I like to say, the teen sensation that's sweeping the world. Yeah. <laughs> not really. Some people. Some, some people, people like it. My mom does. That's good. That's good that she she should support you in all that you <laughs> do. Right. My parents listen to the show, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> Probably listening right now. Hi, Mom and Dad. Um, and also Sexy Pizza. Sexy Pizza is um, here in Denver, Wednesdays from 11 to 2. Not not later, but like 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. You can get a dollar slice if you buy a drink. And here's a fun fact about Sexy Pizza. And we t- talked about this once before, that they have certain pizzas that are – like dedicated to certain charities really yeah so like if you buy one of the pizzas like a dollar goes to a certain charity and um uh, now I, I feel bad because i didn't check but i'm almost positive that they have a pizza for the harm reduction action center which we will be talking about later because we're talking about opioids and the harm reduction action center does a lot of work in denver what is your favorite pizza at sexy pizza i'm like i don't get anything like surprising i really just get like it's Hawaiian style pizza. I love Hawaiian style pizza. It's really That's really good. It's one of those things that, <laughs> when I first had it when I was a kid, I thought it would be weird, but it's, it's fantastic. Mm. So, speaking of things that are addictive and delicious, let's talk about opium. <laughs> Have you ever had opium, Becca? I've never had opium. I was at, um, I was at a music festival once, the All Good Festival, which is it was just like a shit show, but um, great music, but. Interesting festival, as far as that goes. And um, someone was doing opium. There? So Smoking I it? met what? these guys who were like obsessed with getting opium, and I was just standing by them while like widespread panic was playing. Is it was it like a retro hipster thing? I don't know, but they fashioned. I don't know what they want because I guess they just liked opium, and I'm not there to judge them. Oh, they'd had it before. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they were like go- going, and they found some opium. So one of the friend came and was like, "I got the opium." And then they fashioned this like weird thing to smoke it. And it was just very, like I'd never seen it done before. And so it was very odd to me to see. Cause like, I guess I have this like weird idea based on all these books from the ni- 19th century about what opium is. Cause that's, a, that's it. Like I, I'm not hanging out in modern op. I mean, I wouldn't even know. But anyway, so they were, they had fashioned this thing. They had like a paper plate or a frisbee and also like a stick that they stuck through it that they put the opium on top of because it was like a little, I don't know, it was like a little, like a little ball. Cake? Yeah. yeah. Not a cake because it felt, it looked very like, it looked more solid than cake. Right. And then they had like a cup over it. It was like really, uh, it sounds makeshift. like a, like that mousetrap game from when you were a kid and you yeah. put, <laughs> sort of a Rube Goldberg thing. <laughs> they just made up. But that's like my only experience with opium was watching these guys not get high off of it because they kept on complaining. They were like, this isn't even working. I'm not even getting high. And I was like, well, you know, you just bought some opium at a music festival. You don't know where that came from. So uh. it's really interesting to me. It's, it's It doesn't seem to be a thing anymore. Although with, you know, artisanal pickles and cheeses and fixie bikes i imagine that it's going to come back at some point here the way well, that the, the way that, that absinthe has but i don't think that i i mean opioids still exist right of course opioids and i that's they're based they're opium based so i think like the idea of smoking opium is one thing but he's not even doing like pure opium he's doing laudanum and they have so this in some way. i i i took it that he did laudanum as well as eating it in the cake form, which was the sort of more primitive. I, I thought that he did it both ways, that he consumed it both ways. Hence the name Eater, right? Huh. Uh, but yeah. I mean, I, no, I but you're wrong. right. But you know what? Like, we're, I feel like we, we might be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Oh, yes. All right. So let's do – it's weird. It's weird. 
that this is uh, a weird book. It's a nonfiction book, but we're going to do a two minute plot because there's a bit of a story here. Because he's he's really talking about how he became addicted and how he stopped becoming addicted. It's actually a really good story. You want to so, tell it? No, I don't. Uh, but you go ahead. <laughs> All right. So Thomas De Quincey was a young lad in um, England whose parents were dead, and he was in the care of guardians. And he did not like the choices the Guardians were making for him regarding his education. He wanted to go to college because he was really smart. He tells you like a million times how smart he is. But he wanted yeah, to go to college. He's a real smarty pants. <laughs> he wanted to go to college, and they wouldn't send him off to Cambridge. They told him to stay in this other school for a while. And he wasn't going to come of age for a while. He came of age in those days in tw- at 21. And he was 17. He took off from the school. He ran away. And basically was living in poverty. Like, he was incredibly poor for a long time. Befriended a prostitute, as one does when you're in poverty. Um, befriended an orphan child. Again, something you do while you're in poverty in the in the 19th century. Nowadays, I don't know what, you probably don't befriend that many orphan children and prostitutes. It was just a thing they did back then. <laughs> um, but uh, he finally gets on his feet. But as a result of this time, he's stuck with uh, like headaches and and terrible stomach pains. Terrible too. stomach pains. And so he's complaining of a headache to a friend of his. And the friend's like, oh, you should try opium. Oh, As yeah. one does. The That's opium. <laughs> well, that was, I mean, there wasn't a whole During lot of During the time, that was the thing that people did. Yeah. And so. Um, and it works. He goes and does the opium and he really enjoys it. And he was using it moderately for quite a while. He would use it on like Tuesdays and Saturdays. Those were his opium days. He used laudanum, really. Mm-hmm. And then. Uh, about eight years in, his addiction to opium became overwhelming. He wasn't able to control his desire for it anymore. And so he, this book really talks about how he had these scary nightmares. He still has them, even though he's gotten off opium. But the and point it, of the book is that there are good things with opium, but there are very bad things with opium, and he had to get off of it. And he kind of divides the book into three parts, the first being his sort of backstory, which is actually a lot more interesting than I thought it would be. But yeah. then he, dis- he describes the pleasures of opium and then finally the pains of opium. And in the I, I got the like the free Kindle version of this, yeah. which is inferior to the ones you can get in print. Um, and But for some reason, it included in the back these... Uh, so it was apparently originally run as a sort of a serial magazine story. And he was supposed to come through with another part of the story, and he never did. And so there's this whole letter I- in the end of my edition from the from the magazine to its readers apologizing and saying how awful this guy is for having uh, uh, shorted the, the readers. Wow. The final I didn't get that. Episode. Now I feel See? like I've been shorted. And, you know, not... here's the thing about this this book. It's extremely short. I mean, it's yeah. like a one-day read easily. Um, and it's now in the public domain, so you can just go out there and download it from 10 million different places for free. So I highly suggest you do it because it's actually – I thought really beautiful writing. What did you think? Um, I found it really, I mean, it's 19th century writing. And yeah. it's it's early 19th century writing. And I feel like he's coming off a very gothic period. It felt a little melodramatic. I mean, it's not not that it's like ugly, but it was this like. from you who adores like Jane Austen and the Brontes and all that. Oh, at one point Come in on. this, he's like, I was on the, he's on the steps or something, and he's talking about how he seized up in, in a faint. And oh, sweet Anne, the prostitute's name is Anne, by the way. Oh, sweet Anne ran off to buy him some mulled wine, and oh, what an <laughs> angel. And what had she had to do to pay for this spice? And it was just seemed Well, very, okay, I want to come to the defense of that in a second. But I have to say, how cool is it that, like, you're, you're starving to death, basically in the streets of... London in 1804, and you collapse from hunger, and then your prostitute friends runs off. And what does she bring back? A glass of port, right? Well, that's As what well. they used to do. That was like their medicine, which is why probably people became addicted to opium. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but so here's the thing. I want to defend the melodrama okay. of it because like, if you are so – if the poverty is so powerful that you're – you know, like you have to – he, he, there's scenes where he's cuddling up with a, this little orphan girl 
for warmth in the winter and they find like half a blanket or whatever or, a, or a, you know, some furniture upholstery. Why are you laughing at this? It's just tragic. Seems, it's you know, tragic. So, it just so seems that so is melodramatic. The stuff of melodrama. Like, yeah. You yeah. Know, like if it were fiction, then it would be melodramatic. But the fact that it's I, allegedly true, I, I get why he's well, being melodramatic because it is melodramatic. Here's the thing. Like I, that, I guess, because it feels so melodramatic, it, it it just makes it seem, and I know, I know that it's hard because especially when bad things have happened to you, it always kind of sounds a little melodramatic. And so it becomes difficult to explain like what the real problem is if like a million terrible things have like lined up all at once right. to be bad. So it, it, I don't know. Like it's terrible what happened to him and it's terrible that then he, he became an opium addict because of it. It makes me and a little angry it, though that you're, that you're getting on his case for being melodramatic and you're, and when you like uh, all this romantic crap, frankly, from the other parts of the 19th century. But I have yeah. to say this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> I thought it was great when Heathcliff was like bashing his head out against the rock. I was like, "This is brilliant. This is brilliant because it's fiction." So I right. guess again, I don't know why. I see. So this I is don't the know thing. why I wanted as, him to tone it down. As a bit. you can <laughs> tell, and as I've, uh, as Becca knows, I have this absolute hatred of 19th century English literature. I don't know why. I just do. But it seems to be like it, it, it's all it, – they have no sense of economy with their language. It's like why use five words when 50 will, will do or you know, everything is better with a, an allusion to Greek uh, mythology. And it really annoys me. However, that said, what I liked about this and the reason I'm going to give this one book a pass is because it really dealt with – this wasn't some kind of sweetly – sweet uh, romantic story with Heathcliff and Wuthering Heights and the Heath and ugh, all that stuff. This was about like this abject poverty that this guy is living through and, you know, his struggles with opium, which to hear him describe it, man, I want to give it a try. But I know that I, but I, know <laughs> I, that I can't because yeah. it would just be like, I would instantly become addicted. It's the same reason I've never tried cocaine because I just know that that's the drug for me. You know, <laughs> I, would, I would be hooked right then and there. Um, um, go on. But I think, I, I don't know, I guess I like Dickens and he deals with the same thing, but. That's true. Uh, so- I, I like Dickens okay. Okay. All right. I, I just don't like the Austins. Um, <laughs> she okay. Anyway, you know All what though? Right. You know what we kind of missed here. Why are we even talking about this book? Oh, okay. Why, why so is this important? Reasons that we're talking about this book. Um, dr- so one of the reasons is it will come up again. Opium will come up. It came up already. We already. It was uh, in Tenant of Wildfell Hall. One thing that uh, God, what's her, Helen's husband is doing is a little. He's doing opium. Um, but it will come up again. Nemo does heroin in, uh, I'm sorry, Nemo dies of opium, uh, an opium overdose in Bleak House. Uh, Dorian Gray is addicted to opium, and that's one of the that's things right. that makes him so bad. That's right. Doesn't he smoke, like, Constantly. cigarettes? He, he smokes cigarettes laced with opium or something He's, like that. He was like, I'm a, like, oh, that is so cool. Really into <laughs> opium. <laughs> you're, like, you're basically becoming an opium addict. I know, and I've never I'm tried like it. Yeah. Sitting here, it's very odd. I've never odd. tried it. But uh, it's going to come up again. Like it's not, this is not a new thing. It's going to come up again, and then uh, it's a Coleridge, recurring theme in in nineteenth century yeah, literature. Yeah, and a lot right. of them were very addicted. Coleridge was addicted. Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is the result of opioids, likely mm-hmm. laudanum. Um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who wrote one of the most famous sonnets in the world, that uh, "How do I love thee? Let me count the ways." Right. She was uh, she was addicted because she she had some illness and. Um, they gave it to her as a painkiller, so she grew up. Percy Bysshe Shelley was also his a heart big, uh, calcified. Opium head. Have you? Oh, if anyone has like thirty minutes to spare and wants to have a good time, go read Percy Bysshe Shelley's Wikipedia page because it's amazing. It's just people. I'm gonna do that. Like one of the methods for getting someone to fall in love with you, according to this Wikipedia page, is to be like, "If you leave, I will kill myself," and that will get them oh, yeah. to do basically anything you want because that's all the Wikipedia pages. Just people threatening to kill themselves. I think I've even tried that one. It didn't work. Yeah, it's um, probably a terrible idea. But that's one of the reasons that we're doing uh, this because we, we want to get an understanding. It's good to get an understanding of it when we go into and discuss these things. Obviously, you won't be here since you hate 19th century British lit <laughs> so much, but maybe other people will. But, it's, you know, well, interestingly enough, in a couple of weeks, we are actually doing another 19th book. century 
yeah. English literature, and I'm going to be co-hosting that one. But I, I, I think one of the interesting things is that we have this sort of impression that that drugs and drug memoirs are a 20th century or, or, or more recent phenomenon that they that they are that that maybe they started with Naked Lunch or something like that. But but they didn't. They go all the way back. This is sort of I, I think maybe the 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 ur text or the prototype for all drug memoirs. This is, I mean, because drugs didn't become illegal until like the 20th century, really. I mean, opioids did become more illegal in the 1860s when there was a big push to get people away from pharmacists and midwives and to uh, doctors, and there's another thing that became illegal during that time that we won't talk about because it's a hot button issue. But what? abortion became illegal because midwives were performing abortion. Is that why it became? I didn't know that. Interesting. There was like one small Christian, but uh, yeah, if you look at the Catholic Church, doesn't have an opinion on it for a long time. But like I said, I don't want to huh. discuss that because we could go on forever. And this this one's about opium, but that's when it became illegal. Opioids became really illegal during the 1860s and started going more like you had to have a doctor prescribe them. And then they became really illegal in the 20th century. So it was pretty common. Can I give you an interesting bit of trivia about opium being illegal? Okay. So (laughs) that is so suspicious looking right now. She's uh, (laughs) all right. So um, it was outlawed in China actually in 1729, but the British were trying to subvert China and uh, brought in, uh, basically started importing uh, opium from from India and selling it in China, and this was the start of the uh, the opium wars uh, in the in the 1700s. So you basically had the British government through the through their East India Company becoming what is the equivalent of that time of the, the Medellin drug cartel. You know, uh, the British government actually importing drugs on a massive scale into China where it was illegal. And then it became quite popular in China. And one of the reasons that it got such a bad reputation in the United States was because of the racism against the Chinese, okay, when they came here, even though the origins of the whole Chinese opium mythology actually came about because of the British. Uh, I find that interesting. That is I don't very know about you. But anyway. But yes. So Sorry. No, that's fine. Uh, drug memoirs. So as we're saying, this one, uh, I actually have an article in the Hemp Connoisseur, if anyone's interested in things I do. <laughs> but I have an article in the Hemp <laughs> Connoisseur about um, cannabis in tw- uh, a lot of, in literature, it really, the article really does discuss the 19th century quite a bit because cannabis was also another one that they were doing memoirs of. Baudelaire does one called The Poem of Hashish, and he used to smoke pot with Victor Hugo. They nice. really s- smoked really? hashish. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They had like a little club that they would That's hang out and do that. So, drugs in the 19th century were definitely legal, and it's great because it gives us a lot of insight into what we're doing in the modern world because things have, have so changed. And one of the other reasons that we're doing this is because I have been going to a lot of things where um, the discussion of modern, modern opioid use is, it's, I've been going to these discussions of modern opioid use. Like the day after our, the reason I bought this book actually, the day after our first episode aired, I went to an opioid symposium put on by the Drug Policy Alliance where we discussed what is being done to reduce the harms of opium, Hmm. of opioid addiction, and things like that. And I just, I think it's all connected. So I want to have a better understanding of my world. So I look to the past, and I look to books, because that's what I do. And you don't get a lot of books from modern heroin addicts other than Burroughs, William S. Burroughs. Yeah. But he did everything. So yeah, he did. He, he really was count. not. He was not loyal to heroin alone. He, he used to, okay. So this is a total aside, but he did uh, nutmeg in the back of Naked Lunch. He like lists all the drugs and what they'll do to you. And I had this. Ass- <laughs> I had a class on the beats in college, and like right before our presentation, because we were doing drugs on the beats, I was like, "Yes, I think I'm gonna try this nutmeg thing." Because if you take nutmeg, it will get you high. If you Even eat like you a whole. It. A whole t- tablespoon or something, like a teaspoon or two. I can't remember how much it is, but it, he Ooh. like lists anyone. That's really interesting. Yeah. So, um, 
he lists this, and I was like, I'm going to try this nutmeg thing, because, I mean, how dangerous can it be? Since it's, And basically, I was talked down by my entire team. They were like, well, you can't go in high on nutmeg to do that this presentation. But it does sound interesting, doesn't it? I my, mean, one of my favorite bits of, <laughs> of Naked Lunch tri- trivia is, do you know the band Steely Dan? Yeah. Yeah, so that's the name of a talking dildo in the book. That's... Wow, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> so, I didn't actually read the book. <laughs> anyway. So Okay, um, so we've talked about uh why we're doing this. So let's so, talk about about his um Let's talk about the author because he's really the main character. Yeah, we'll talk about this. the author and we'll talk about like how his what, what was it, what were his, his experiences? Into yeah. Opium is com- was common and is common. So um So what did you think? Did you like De Quincey? No, he seemed like an asshole. Like I felt bad for him because he's obviously dealing with an addiction, but uh, which is hard. But like at the same time, he has a, a problem with authority, like just in general. Like, a gen- and then he's always like, "I was so much smarter than that guy. I was so much smarter than that he, guy." Yeah, that is like, true. He is, even, but I, he has actually a lot of. I, I do think he is very smart, and I, he has well, a lot no, of I think insights he is too, but into things. I wish that he were alive so I could hang out with him. Actually, I would invite him. To I wouldn't because w- I feel like he'd be really whiny. Like he might be kind of whiny, and I feel like he would just be one of those guys who's like constantly sniggering about like how stupid everyone else in the world. You is. know what I think is funny though <laughs> is that this guy is such a smarty pants, right? So his yeah. whole thing is he's talking about. So he's apparently some kind of uh, scholar in ancient Greek. He speaks a number of other languages like Latin and French and German, but he's his big thing is ancient Greek, uh, and so. He's a real smarty pants, and in my version, because I don't have like a, a, a decent printed copy of it, just the cheap Kindle version, it'll. There were por- points in the original manuscript where he would just start writing things in Greek, like in actual Greek characters and everything. Yeah. And so, without any sort of warning or transition or translation, all of a sudden the English writing would stop and it would begin in Greek, uh, which apparently was the way the uh, you know I'm expected to know this somehow, uh, but. My point is, what, I, what cracked me up, and I actually was laughing out loud, is that when he, tr- when he takes opium, the things that he does are – what would you do if you're on opium? I mean – I don't know because I've never been right. on opium, I so think, I really don't know. You know, I, maybe chill out with friends. I have no idea. But he goes yeah. to the opera, right? I love oh, that, yeah. that he goes to the opera. And then um, – I think – I guess because – yeah. Maybe because okay, so I was at the music festival. That's the only experience I've ever had with o- with opium. Opium is those guys at the music festival who were doing it, and I guess like they're at a music festival. I guess it music. makes sense. So if you're into that, but then people do. But then he describes like in one of the parts of the book, it describes him going off into this idyllic environment. And here I, I actually thought of you because this sounds like a perfect Becca Chavez lifestyle, having a little cottage in oh, the yeah, mountains it sounded lovely. with 5,000 books in it. And he just <laughs> hangs out all day and he has a servant who makes his food. Uh, has, did you feel that the servant might be actually like someone he's having an affair with? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. that was the sense I got. He's talking about like, having this like, like attractive like, servant around and he just kind of like, throws it out there. I don't like the assumptions people have about that. And you're like, well, right. I didn't have any assumptions until you mentioned that I might have assumptions. Yeah, just a solo guy, a servant, <laughs> and, a, and a lady servant. Um, nothing strange there. But he talks about how when he's in the mountains, right, he's living in this mountain cottage, and he he takes opium. And his favorite pastime while he does this is to read Kant. And yeah. I, I just, I, yeah. I, I find that bizarre. But then when he's like in the in the worst part of his addiction, Oh, I love this part. He, he, when he's in the worst throes of his addiction and he's just totally failing intellectually, the only thing that he can bring himself to do is study economics. And so he decides while he's, I think, I got the impression while he was going through withdrawal <laughs> that he decides to write a book about economics. And, uh, and, he, and he actually uh, publishes it. So I, I, I found that quite entertaining. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, like, I guess people have their things and that. Makes us, and plus, I think if we're men- talking about De Quincey, we should talk about the fact that he's a, he's a little bit privileged. So he's not like, um, well, yeah. I mean, when you look at modern day opioid addicts or people who use opium, they're usually not. It, it costs a lot of money, and it puts them. In, it's difficult to hold down a job. Whereas De Quincey inherited a lot of wealth, so he doesn't he really have to worry about like not doing opioids. Can while I tell he the listeners just how much wealth? Yes. Because I did the math on it. I actually yes. did. I didn't even look it up or anything. There was no 
Google page that just figures there it out There is for one, you. though, just so you know, if you're trying to like find out how much Mr. Darcy made every Come year. Come on. Let me Go do ahead. this. Go ahead. So Talk about how you... When he turned 21, which would have been 1806, he inherited 2,000 pounds from his deceased father, right? So he turns 21. He's an adult. He gets his trust fund of 2,000 pounds. It doesn't sound like that much. It's about $187,000 today, a nice sum. But that's not all there is to the story because it doesn't translate so directly. And according to some sources, that in terms of like its prestige and what it was able to buy you, it was actually the equivalent of like $5 million uh, that he inherited, Crazy. which is an insane amount and of money. And just remember that that's what Mr. Bennett and his five daughters, Mrs. Ms. the Bennett family, Pride and Prejudice, that's what they lived on, 2,000 pounds a year. That's a lot of money. Well, yeah, but to, to read that, you would think they were in squalor, like the way they talk. It well, does seem like a lot of money when you really think about it, like five million dollars a year. But yeah. Miss Bennett's like, "Oh, we're in poverty. You have to marry well." Wow! But was that in eighteen oh six? It was like in eighteen oh two. No, oh, okay. it was probably before that actually. So, but he was ninety seven. De Quincey was very bad with money, and he ended up squandering most everything he had. Uh, he would give loans that would never be repaid to his friends. Like Coleridge was one of his friends. He also bought a lot of books. He bought 5,000 books. They were very yeah. expensive at the time. I know. Uh, you people are sick, you book addicts. I would totally – that's <laughs> one thing. Like if people – if I die in poverty, people are going to come into my house and be like, oh, there's sure a lot of books around here. This poor woman died in poverty and alone. What if, you, what if you're old and you get crushed by a bookshelf? Fall, oh like my. you're reaching for <laughs> – Weathering Heights, you know, up on the top shelf, and the bookshelf topples over. Oh my goodness! And the cat is like, you There's know, no nibbling oh, your body. Do you want to hear? Uh, this is a total <laughs> aside about uh, how, because I don't like cats. I'm not a cat person, but I figured out like if I ever do die alone and the cat comes and eats my body, like it's gonna be the neighbor's cat. Like she'll be a cat lady, right? But because her cats have come over to my place and eaten my body, she'll be liberated and she'll go on to find love. That is so bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's be serious about this opium here. Let's get to, well, let's talk mm. about his in his background when he's in poverty. I thought it was really touching that part about uh, the prostitute, Anne, who he was clearly in love with. I thought it was so I cute. thought he was like romanticizing something that didn't really so, have to be that romanticized. No, I you know, I don't think so. I thought that he found in her sort of a, a kindred spirit. He actually, you know, unlike a lot of literature and unlike the prevailing social attitudes of the day, he didn't look at her as morally depraved. He looked at her as a woman in desperate straits that was, you know, clearly but but who was, you know, noble nonetheless, the hooker with the heart of gold, so to speak, you know. But she was genuinely kind to him. She saved his life uh, when he was starving to death. And I know you think that's melodramatic. I just found it really sweet, though. Well, no, it's not so much. I, I think he brings her up in kind of, I just, I just felt like it was a little. Melodramatic. Melodramatic, a little manipulative. Like, like everyone who's in poverty at that time has to befriend an orphan and a prostitute like well but think it about feels, it there was no I, social safety net at the time no you know? there's not and i guess one of the things that annoys me is he keeps talking about her keeps bringing her up and he's like oh, i just don't know what happened to her that but she, bothered me she, a little bit too she died like she well, very clearly died well I he loses like, track he loses track of her uh and and the reason that he loses track of her and this is a, it's a completely lame excuse he's i didn't know her last name <laughs> After all this, I never knew her last name. Yes. So how could I possibly have? See, it's stuff like that. Like he didn't <laughs> actually that? really care. And That's... then like he he so leaves I question her. The sincerity. Yeah, yeah, he leaves her to go get a, a loan from a friend, like secure a backing for a loan. Really, he's going to Eaton, and um, right. It and when he leaves, he's like, he goes off, and then he comes back. He's like, Anne. Oh, by the way, I never uh, was able to find Anne. And then like a couple pages later, he's like. Oh yeah, and she had like a really bad cough too. By the way, like right. <laughs> she was. So she's probably dead. But then he yeah. said that he hoped that she died rather than having to suffer through a long life. So yes, ridiculous. it was melodramatic. So uh, I'm like I said though, I'm gonna give it a pass. This guy though, I we this you would be unable to discuss this book without discussing Orientalism. 
And his racism. He's yeah, like totally quite. racist. And Well, yeah. Okay. No, I mean, and there's I don't no think, qualifiers. Here. Yeah. I mean, I don't think... I think... I, I mean, I've listed it here on the outline, attitudes at the time towards race. Yeah. But it's really important that when we look back... At, like, these stem from... It's, it's racism is racism regardless of the time and you can say like yeah somebody lived within this time and all that but racism is racism and it really exists and it permeates and it belongs to everybody in society and Thomas De Quincey is no exception oh, no. to the racism that is part of society and he he actually is very like as himself he's not just living within a racist society where he's privileged he himself is very racist um, well yeah but this is the prime time for the English Empire yeah you know? but so. some of the things that he, like in when he goes into the pains of opium mm-hmm. at the end, like he has these scary. He's like, I would never want to live in China. Like, ew, China. <laughs> right. I would never well, live there. And then he like goes into these awful dreams he has where he's like living in China and it's so scary to him because he's he hates. He's being it. chased <laughs> by Shiva and uh, well. So I just want to comment. First of all, just on Orientalism as such and as it relates to opium is that, you know, since opium did come from Asia, right? So it was freighted with all of these, all of this imagery, all of this stuff about sultans and harems and exotic silks and all of this kind of stuff. And so um, all of this sort of uh, racially tinged baggage goes with it. Um, fascination with the exoticness of other lands. And so the idea is if you take this, you're really partaking of that culture, you know. Um, but it, it reached sort of absurd levels, like when he, and this is why De Quincey's kind of an idiot and also kind of a jerk. I, I didn't like that that part where he, he needs to take out a loan, right? So he goes to his friends, the Jews, who are, <laughs> he refers to them as the Jews and they're money lenders. He's like, those Jews, my, yeah. my friend didn't like the Jews. So I had to go and talk to them, um, which is, you know, uh, pretty, again, pretty typical for the time. But uh, in, in any case, so he's living in the mountains and wh- who should wander into his home but a Malaysian guy, right? <laughs> yeah. So a guy from Malaysia. And so the Malaysian guy doesn't speak English and he doesn't speak Malay. So how he thinks to communicate with him is by speaking with him in ancient Greek, thinking that because Greek would be geographically closer to Malaysia (laughs) than English that he might understand it. It was so absurd. I mean, what a raging idiot. Yeah, Um, well, he's high on opium. uh, That's true. But then he's also (laughs) impressed with the Malay's uh, ability to take a lot. So he gets stoned with the Malaysian guy. Well... Or no, he gives him a gift. He gives him the... He's like, oh, yeah, and this is really good too because he's like... What can I give this guy? Oh, I know. He'll like opium because he's from Malaysia. Right. And then he like brings him some opium and the guy does. And this is like and where- the guy has, he gives him basically what amounts to three doses of opium. And he says yeah. it's enough to kill, you know, like if you're to take it all at once. And the Malaysian guy takes it all at once and and then wanders off. And, and so De Quincey thinks, oh, either he really knows what he's doing and has an extremely high tolerance <laughs> or I'll hear about them finding a dead yeah. Malaysian guy. And- I got the sense that he's like, he was probably after that, like going to his neighbors, like, so did you hear about any dead Malaysian guys lying around? Like, right. he's just like, that's the kind of person he seems like he is. So, so, um, but that brings up like how he's consuming this opium because he gives it to the Malaysian guy, right? And it sounds like little cakes, mm-hmm. but laudanum which is what he's really taking is a combination of opium and alcohol which when i found out i was like well that makes it kind of like it's one thing to just be like i'm gonna drink another thing to be like i'm gonna take opium but you're like i'm gonna combine these two (laughs) into like the ultimate (laughs) and see what happens and so probably end well it's not just just that he's taking opium it's that he's like Drinking copious amounts of alcohol, too. Like, this could be part of the problem, that he's consuming all this opium with so much alcohol. If that's how he's taking it, that's that's got to have it. Do you know what kind of alcohol it was? I mean, that is, to say, I mean, is it like probably, rum or what? It was probably like wine, just because they drank so much wine back in the day. Right. But, but what yeah. I thought was really good and what was interesting to me, having never taken opium, is to read this uh, account of it that isn't filtered through 
our 20th century accounts of what taking drugs is like, right? So here yeah. it is sort of a, this really, really fresh perspective. It hadn't been written about very much um, where he talks about w what it was really like to take the drugs. And it's, and it's kind of marvelous. And he goes on this thing about how it's nothing at all like alcohol. It's so much different. And there are these great passages in there where he talks about that he can see his entire mental history, all of his memories at once, and he likens oh, it yeah. to how they say when someone dies and their life flashes before their eyes. And he says, and that's kind of what it's like, that he sees all of his memories at one time. And then he talks about how he'll have these sort of dreams of vast architectural spaces that go on forever and how he'll feel like he lives in a... Um, he lives like 70 or 100 years in one night, like time seems to slow down well, while I he's in it. One thing that's so great about this, like you said, it's not filtered through the modern thing. And I think one thing we like to do nowadays is be like, drugs are bad. So when we write about drugs, we're going to write about them in a way that makes them bad. And so I, right. I really like that he does, I mean, you describe something that kind of in this way, it sounds awesome. Ooh, oh, yeah, yes, like, absolutely. I can see all my memories and walk through. And so I think it's good, too, that at the same time, you know, he's like, but it got really scary. Like, he's not... So I feel like it's a very honest account. Demoni yeah, he's not demonizing it for the sake of demonizing it or being like, and I took all the opium and then I woke up in an opium den. Like, like Right, right, and I had lost worst. all my money and, yeah, you know. Uh, it's interesting that um, at the time, he... This was criticized for precisely that point, that people said, that, you know, this sort of – that was technically pre-Victorian society, yeah. wasn't it? Right. So, but that would have been Regency. It's, yeah. So it's very – it's still very British. Um, you know, so they saw opium eating the same way they ta saw excessive rum drinking or whatever, you know, that it, that it is a moral fault of the person. And so one of the things that they kind of criticize this is sort of the same thing that people would criticize it for today, which is that it, it in addition to just the bad aspects, but it also talks about how awesome it is. You know, and indeed, when he describes it, it does sound absolutely fascinating. And he talks about how, as opposed to alcohol, where alcohol kind of dulls your mental faculties, that this sort of wakes him up and um, it allows you to be extremely creative. And I... I just think, like, as a writer, that might be really, really cool. And, and well, that's as we probably know, probably why Coleridge right, as we was know, like totally Coleridge, into it. Coleridge, Poe, all of these other writers were really into it. But boy, is it dangerous. Um, yeah. And so I think what um, one of the things I want to talk about is how people viewed it and how he got into it. Because it wasn't like a, po I mean, there was somebody I was talking to who was like, oh, yeah, it was totally accepted in the 19th century. And it's it wasn't accepted in the 19th century. That's why it's, that's why Dorian Gray's doing it because he's such a bad, shitty person. And so, like, one of the shitty things he does is go and do a lot of opium in these opium dens. And um, people weren't thinking it was really great that opium addiction happened. And so, I think it's really interesting to talk about like how Thomas De Quincey started doing doing opium, and he mentions it that other people got into it the same way and this is the same way that people in modern society because it's not like we don't think like oh opium that's totally cool go do opioids all day like we still don't we have the same ideas they had except mm -hmm. we just made it opioids illegal really um but he got into it because it was a painkiller and modern day painkillers are still like a reason that people get into opioids i actually have a little thing that was put out um where did I find this? I found this on, like, the government website. But um, people are prescribed opioids nowadays. Like, there's there's opioids and there's non-opioid painkillers that you mm -hmm. can get as a prescription. But sometimes they're difficult to get off, and then people become addicted to them and buy them on the black market, which is why we have people who are, like, totally into Oxy and stuff like that and why that's such a problem. But 1 in 15, according to this thing that I found... It says one in 15 people who take non-medical prescription pain relievers will try heroin within 10 years. So, um, eh, it's just a sign I'm not, of, I'm not buying that. It, that sounds to me like the, the, the whole pot is a gateway drug argument, like a different version of that. You, you know? don't believe that? No, I don't, because I think if you reverse engineer it, right, that's like saying that, um, oh, uh, what's the number in that case? 
This says one in 15 people who take non-medical prescription pain relievers will try heroin. Right. That's like saying that um, people who ride bicycles have a higher chance of uh, of driving motorcycles, right? Because you look at the thing backwards, like what percentage of motorcycle drivers can also ride a bicycle? But these are all the same thing. I mean, opioids are opioids. Yeah. So they're already using opioids. Heroin's cheaper than prescription painkillers. Oh, is that the logic of it? That's okay, actually I what's see. happening. And there's like, and I mean, this is just something I, I picked up really quickly because that is what's happening. The, the price of um, prescription painkillers is going through the roof. So people are turning to cheaper options. Right. Or something that like a drug dealer could cut with something else, which is something that could happen with heroin. So I had, I had my wisdom teeth taken out a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a little late, but um, I had them. Most people have it done as a teenager, but the doctor had given me some Percocet. Is Percocet an opioid? I believe so. I can double so check. So I had never had Percocet before, and I have to say, boy, howdy. <laughs> that must be what love feels like. You know, you're all warm and cozy. Uh, it's fantastic stuff. I'm glad he only gave me like four of them. Yeah, uh, it actually is um, an opioid. It's funny that you bring that up. When I went to this opioid symposium, mm-hmm. uh, is this an opioid? I believe so. When when I went to this opioid symposium, one of the girls that spoke um, about her heroin addiction, she became addicted to painkillers after going to get her wisdom teeth out. Nice. And her mother accidentally gave her a double dose of the painkiller, and that was like the start of her addiction. And um, she got clean of prescription painkillers, and then like after she had gone through rehab, she started using heroin. Oh. Yeah. So, that, which is kind of... So, so that worked well. Then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. That's really um, sad. It awful. was really sad. And I think, um, I mean, now that we're getting into this, it, it, De Quincey, it was addicted to the opioids, obviously. And it was really so difficult think- for him. And then he says, this is how he gets off. Opioids, he says, I saw that I must die if I continue the opium. I determined, therefore, that should that if that should be required to die and throwing it off. Like that's how deep the addiction was. And he and that's how about awful it was too. Withdrawal yeah. and how terrible it is. And um And, and it, it sounds like it it's it could have come straight from the train spotting, really. You know, yeah. when he talks about the DTs that he had, the vomiting, the you know, this this idea that he's hallucinations, that he was going insane. Um, and he talks about this. And now I, I am, imagine going through that, though, at a time when the culture had no real appreciation of what addiction was or what withdrawal could be like. Because now, of course, we understand it somewhat better. Uh, and there are ways of handling in a medical environment withdrawal. There are, but I think one of the problems that we're dealing with, I mean, with modern addiction, there's a stigma of addiction that hinders hinders the ability to get people help. And there's this, this idea that um, if you're addicted to heroin or you're addicted to opioids or you're addicted to anything, this is something that you've done to yourself and so you deserve what you get mm-hmm. from, exactly. um, from the addiction, what results from it. But, like, I think about quitting smoking and I quit smoking – almost nine months ago. And obviously smoking is nothing like opioid addiction, but I had to quit smoking like five or six times before it took, you know? Right. And so right. like this idea that we have that we, we continuously, I, I feel like there's kind of this idea that if we punish people for wanting to use opium enough, that's it. They'll stop. And that's just, it's just nonsense. Like you have to. Well, that's the basis of our uh, our war on drugs and our entire prison industrial complex. Yeah, I mean, but you have to create a system where people can actually get better. And um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about for a second is um, like kind of why I'm interested in opiate. I had gotten interested in. Um, drug policy really like a long time ago uh around the time that amendment 64 was coming into play here in colorado so it, well, a for lot those of those who aren't in colorado can you say what amendment 64 amendment 64 was? legalized marijuana for rec- recreational use right so um really when i first got into it i was very much 
like an economic backer. I was like, oh, this will create jobs. We'll get tax revenue. This will be great on all these levels. And it, as time went on, I became more of a, okay, and then there's mass incarceration too. But the moment that really, like, I think I had this aha moment was at the Drug Policy Alliance Conference. I was covering it as a journalist. And I went in there, and one of these guys I talked to, and he was just there because he wanted to be there. He was this um, older man, probably in his 60s or 70s. And when I asked him why he was there, he said he was there because his son had overdosed on heroin. And it wasn't just that his son had overdosed on heroin. It's that the cops, when the cops arrived, when first responders came, his son was still alive. And they could have saved his life. There's a drug called Nioxin mm. that works as an antidote. They could have saved his life. But they couldn't legally. You have to get a prescription for nioxin, and they didn't have time to get that, and they wouldn't know how to administer it. So his son basically died while being watched by first responders because this drug wasn't available. And I think that was the first moment where I, I really realized like, just how far the war on drugs is going, especially in regards to opium, because I, I had always had for a really long time that same kind of negative feeling mm -hmm. like, oh, this is something you get into and you, like, I don't know why someone would get addicted to it, but they did and that's a choice they made, so. I had but that like, attitude for a long time, too. Yeah. And it was, and, and really what it was is over time, I, I got to know enough people who were extremely good people, but who either were addicts or had been addicts and had kicked the habit, that I realized that it was more of a disease. And that, I mean, I personally, I've, done everything possible to become an alcoholic. And for some reason, <laughs> it never clicked, right? And so um, uh, you really see it. You start to see things differently. And it, if you take away that sort of veil of morality about it, yeah. it becomes very, very clear that this is something that needs to be treated on a, on a medical and a psychological level as opposed to throwing somebody in prison for it and ruining not only their lives but their families' lives as well. Or even to like the issue of um I and I don't know where this idea started, but like the tough love thing that somehow an addiction is gonna get better if you take away someone's resources, that somehow that's gonna make and, and, and people do this for all kinds of things that I, I'm not gonna get into like but the idea that oh my kid's addicted so I will cut him off financially and make things hard. Like when when you, you do that um, but one of the stories I heard from someone was that because she was, she didn't have access to clean needles, she didn't have access to anything, she was doing heroin in this dirty, dingy hotel room, bathroom, and she dropped a cotton ball on the floor that they use for, for it, and um, she ended up getting a staph infection, and they thought for a while that she was going to die, because not because of the heroin, she lived through that dose, but because she had this other infection now this bacterial infection within her and if you keep saying like oh that's something you get because that's a, like that doesn't give someone the opportunity to get better no like saying like oh well you know dying is one of the risks well it is but that doesn't give someone the opportunity to get better and well sharing dirty needles you might get hepatitis yeah that's true but that doesn't give someone the opportunity to get better so i think instead of focusing on like let's make things as miserable as possible so that you get better. Like, let's make sure that you have the chance to get better. Because let's say after the first time I tried to quit smoking and I picked up the next cigarette, you know, and I was like, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Smoked another cigarette. It was just too much for my body to take. And instead of, you know, just feeling lightheaded, I died. Then, I, there, then there would be no chance for me to actually quit smoking cigarettes, right. you know? And I think so. that's one of the things that this book does so well is that it it really describes that sort of withdrawal process in well the whole addiction and withdrawal process in a way that's very non-judgmental it doesn't talk about the 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 his he doesn't describe it as really a moral failure as much as he does describing it sort of factually or well or poetically but there is no sense of moralism there in fact he talks about he sort of gives a note to other opium addicts at the end saying basically Good luck with that. This is the hardest thing that you'll ever yeah. do. And it's and it's again, it's interesting because when you read it, and you're, what you're reading is something from not just the 19th century, but from fairly early in the 19th century, 1821. You know, before it became a thing, really. You know, when when opium was still rather exotic in that world, and um, so it, you're reading it 
very much unfiltered by all of the literature that that has come since. And that was what was really refreshing to see. Yeah. Um, I really liked it. And I thought it was it was a good introduction to this, definitely, and a good introduction to the subject. And for those who are interested in, I'm going to go over some some ways to get more information about this because there are lots of resources for people who are interested in opioids, interested in kind of um, – I mean, we talked a lot about how we feel about the addiction aspect of it, and I think I think it'd be nice to put people in a direction to see how they can help with sure. opioids. Let's do it. Um, so first of all, the Drug Policy Alliance. Like I said, I went to the DPA conference, and that was when I first changed my mind on drugs. Drug Policy Alliance is active in every single state. They do. You'll hear a lot about them most often from their work with. Uh, their work with marijuana, but they do have a focus on opioids and you can contact them. I mean, their, their, um, their website is drugpolicy.org and they're doing a lot of work to get Nioxin legal. Nioxin, as you remember, is that drug that can save people's lives. Here in Colorado, this is really big news, but here in Colorado in the last legislative session, we passed a law that said we have standing orders here for Nioxin. So if a police officer does happen to come across someone who's overdosing. The hope is that they'd be trained to use it, mm-hmm. but um, they would be able to save their life with nioxin. And uh, is that to say that so the the cops would carry a dose with it the way they, they that might would be carry the an hope. EpiPen or yeah, yeah, that you would carry it around like that. Obviously, it's expensive, so it's difficult to get. And technically, you're supposed to have a doctor a doctor prescribe it, but there is a doctor. I was at a a um, fundraiser. And one of the guys there was the doctor who will always sign, no matter what, he'll sign it for Nioxin. Because I I don't know if it's not addictive. I don't really know what the fact is with Nioxin, but it saves lives. If you know someone who's going through heroin addiction, definitely get trained on how to use Nioxin and how to administer it and get a prescription and keep it in your house. And um, here in the state of Colorado, we're really, really lucky. We have this thing called the Harm Reduction Action Center. So if you're in Colorado, like I said, there's a pizza, Sexy Pizza, that's a harm reduction action center pizza. But um, they're also a great place to go. Or if you know someone who's addicted to opioids, they do a needle exchange so that there's no – it lessens the risk of AIDS being transmitted, of hepatitis being transmitted. Here's an interesting thing about needle exchange. Um, There's a place up in Vancouver, and in Vancouver um, they actually have – a place where you can see people, it's a, God, what do they call it? They have a word for it. And it is um, an injection site, uh, oh. an injection site. So like if you are addicted to heroin, you could go into this place in Vancouver. That's something we're tr- trying to get because it saves lives apparently. Um, if you're addicted to heroin, you would go in and do your heroin there. And then if you overdose, someone's right there with the drug to, to bring you back. How sensible. It is pretty sensible. And it's it's working. It's saving lives is a thing. Like they don't want it's fantastic. So that's kind of an interesting thing. But you can find out more about that. Um I this would is... go to the Harm Reduction Action Center website. It, this is a Denver thing. But it's a great place to get resources. They're such great people. They'll talk to you if you're interested in doing stuff like this in your state. And that's just harmreductionactioncenter.org. And there might be needle exchange programs. And I know there are needle exchange programs all over the place. So ours just happens to be right across the street from the capital of Colorado. (laughs) (laughs) You know. Very progressive state. Yeah. We're Um, we're trying our best to deal with drugs in a in a positive way. More rational way. Yeah. Um, more effective way, a results-oriented way, if you will. Let's hope. Let's hope. We don't want, we don't want little De Quincey's running around. That's what we don't want. But he's such a good writer. He, I'll tell you. He is a pretty good I writer. I mean, imagine where 19th century literature would be without opium. It would be even oh, more yeah. boring than it already is. I think it's great. But yes, Scott, speaking of 19th century literature, <laughs> that is so boring. So can I, can I do my thing now? Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. So Scott has an issue with the word thou. Right. So here's I don't the thing Go ahead. about the word thou, which is used a lot in this book. Okay. Here's the thing is that you don't cut, Gabe, you cut me off. No, you're uh, good. All right. You, you... So here's the thing about the word thou. Okay. Everyone uses it. Like when you go to the Renaissance Festival. Do you like the Renaissance Festival? 
I don't. I've like, always I wanted love to do it. Oh, it's so fantastic. Uh, so, uh, okay, go ahead. So anyway, so when you go to the Renaissance Festival, people say, uh, oh, how art thou? All this. Anyway, they're using it wrong, and that's what bothers me, okay? Because here's the thing. Okay. There's in in the English language, okay, there is only the word you. Okay, whereas in a lot of other European languages, you know, German, you have Z and du. French, you have vous and tu. Spanish, you have usted and tu. Okay. Uh -huh. So there is the, it's a, it's a formal versus informal distinction, right? We don't have that in English, but we used to. And thou was the informal form. But okay? then, wait. No, no, no. Just wait. Just wait. Uh. So when someone, would, so if you were to address a stranger with thou or thy or whatever, that would be an insult. But why is then the Lord's Prayer, like, how uh -huh. be thou name? I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> because in ecclesiastical texts, okay, the Bible, for example, uh -huh. or prayer books, in all of these other languages, um, God is addressed in the familiar form. The idea is that it's supposed to be an intimate relationship between you oh, okay. and God, okay? Like and so, Jesus, I and so, but because it's in these books with archaic language, people associate it with formality as opposed to intimacy. Mm -hmm. And that's why the distinction carries on, or that's why that misconception carries on today. So that's my thing about the word thou. Now you stand corrected. I personally found that, when I read that, I thought that was the most fascinating thing in the world. Maybe you, if you geek out on old stuff like that, then I hope you enjoyed it too. If not, I don't care. <laughs> Becca, wait a minute, we got a minute left. Yeah, so uh, next week. How did you like that present I gave you last week? Okay, oh, it was great. So I read it. Read it. It's all pictures. It's Selfish by part. Kim it's Kardashian. It's Selfies by Kim Kardashian. Um, and so I, I read, well, I looked through it. And uh, I have to say, like, I actually kind of liked it because it. she put a bit, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't, into, maybe it was something that was done by the editors. Who knows? Maybe Kim did it. But it does kind of come off as a bit of a love story and ends with her getting married to Kanye. Oh, really? There's like a mm -hmm. narrative structure to it? Well, not really. But if you look at the pictures, it's progressing towards this thing. And the thing happens to be her wedding to Kanye. So it's oh, kind of sweet. That it's is kind of nice. Yes. Kind of sweet. Um, speaking of love stories. Oh, and <laughs> here's how I'm going to tie it in. Kanye, for those who don't know, is Kim's third husband. So there were three men vying for her affection, and she went with Kanye, who she loved for the longest time. Quite like the hero of next week's story. <laughs> oh, my God. That is such a reach. Okay. That was a reach. That was a reach, especially because her first husband, she divorced him like when she was 19. So, But, um, yeah, Far From the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy is next week. It's 19th century British literature. Again, but it's so fantastic. It's my favorite. Um, I'm going to be out somewhere else doing manly things. Gay, <laughs> gay real oak. Uh, if you want, if you want to be the kind of manly that wins over the ladies, <laughs> you can read all about <laughs> Gabriel Oak <laughs> for next week's episode because he's been. That's the worst name. Gabriel Oak. Gabriel Oak. Oh, he's so he's sturdy like the oak. I don't know. Yeah, you what. think maybe. <laughs> But the other guy, what is Sergeant Troy and then um, Boldwood? I don't know. I, <laughs> Wait, Boldwood? Boldwood really? is the name of the third guy who's kind of, oh, oh, but, you know, we'll talk about it next week. Oh Scott won't be here to talk about it because he hates. Sounds terrible. Whatever. So um, it's fantastic. We're We're leaving now we're done with this i guess show. if you're i guess if you're into like love and 19th century thomas hardy stuff then it's thomas show. hardy's happiest book it's like seriously happy people are happy i'm just kidding people i'm not trying to be all mean about the no book. you are you just i am you just a no, hater. I, now i just feel bad and about as it. taylor swift <laughs> says haters gonna hate 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 and that's you Thank you. <laughs> I, think, I think we're out of time. I think then. we are. It's time to go. Let's just end with a Taylor Swift lyric. <laughs> what better? 